Okay, if we could please ask everyone to be seated. We are going to get ready to start. And we're gonna try, even though this is Toronto, we're gonna try and start on time because we do have uh, people watching this via webcast. So we want to uh, be fair to our friends in Cyberland. Thank you so much. Okay, hi. My name is uh, Jesse Sitnik, and I am the Communications Director for Ecofiscal Commission. And before we get started, I'm just going to go over a few uh, housekeeping notes. So first, I want to welcome everyone who is uh, watching this live via webcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. And I also want to thank all of you who are here in the room tonight. Um, this is going to be a really lively discussion ahead, and we'd like all of you to participate. So we are going to be live tweeting, and we are using the hashtag ecofiscal. So please feel free to grab your phone, note the hashtag, and join along in the conversation. And while you have your phone in your hand, please turn the ringer off. That would be great. Thank you. Um, following the panel discussion, there is going to be a Q&A session as well. Um, if you're in the room and you want to ask a question, just raise your hand, and somebody will come over with the mic. And if you are watching online, there is a, a little box you can put your question into uh, the, on the web platform, and we will read it out loud here in the room, um, and we're going to get to as many of your questions as we can here tonight. Um, and of course, if you are still hungry for more on this topic following tonight's conversation, I welcome you to visit our website ecofiscal.ca. You can find a copy of our newly released report. You can check out our blogs. You can join our uh, newsletter list and our events, all that sort of good fun stuff. And finally, when the clock strikes 6.30 or thereabout, this room is going to magically transform into um, a cocktail lounge. Uh, so please be aware that caterers are going to come through and they're going to sweep up your seats very quickly at the end of the event. And we welcome you to stay, have a glass of wine, mingle, and chat. Um, and that's really it. So let's get to it. Um, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Chris Reagan, who is the chair of Canada's Ecofiscal Commission. Uh, Chris is a professor of economics at McGill University and a research fellow at the C.D. Howe Institute. He holds, uh, he has held posts including special advisor to the Bank of Canada and Clifford Clark, visiting economist at Finance Canada, and he's also really just a great guy. Um, so please join me in welcoming Chris Reagan to the stage. I may be a great guy, but I still need my comments. You want your notes? <laughs> Thank you. Not that, great a guy. Not that great a guy. I'm sure it doesn't say that on my CV. Thank you, Jesse. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this panel discussion on the business of carbon pricing in Ontario. My name is Chris Reagan. I'm the chair of the East Coast Fiscal Commission, and I will say a bit more about the commission uh, in a few moments. But I want to start by thanking the Cement Association of Canada and Sustainable Prosperity for partnering with us on this event. We have assembled a panel of individuals who are not only smart and interesting, but I think uh, they each bring a different perspective and I think uh, sometimes a surprising perspective to this issue. And as Jesse said, we are also interested in hearing from you. Uh, so I want to thank you all, uh, not only those in the gallery today, but those of you uh, across the country who are listening on the webcast, and we look, hearing, uh, look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions after the panel. So let me give you a little background about the Ecofiscal Commission. Some of you may know that yesterday we released a little report on carbon pricing. Uh, the Commission is a group of 12 economists from across the country who have come together united by the conviction that Canada can do better. We can do better in terms of environmental outcomes, we can do better in terms of economic outcomes, and we strongly believe that with smart policy choices, those two things come as a pair. And carbon pricing is the perfect example of what we call eco-fiscal policy. It corrects price signals to encourage the kind of economic activities that we want more of, like jobs and income and profits and investment and innovation, uh, while discouraging the things that we clearly want less of, pollution in general, and in this case, greenhouse gas emissions. Now, of course, 
Carbon price is not the only example of eco-fiscal policy. There are many, including road congestion pricing, pricing for residential garbage, water pollution pricing, and we will talk about all of those things and many more over the next five years. But right now, we are focusing on carbon pricing as an effective means of reducing Canada's greenhouse gas emissions. So you may wonder why we start with this policy. Well, it's not because we are particularly brave, nor, we hope, is it because we are particularly stupid. It is because, like most Canadians, we are practical. So practicality means addressing policy questions when the discussions are live and contributing to those discussions in a constructive way when governments are looking for the best policy approaches. Well, these discussions are now live across the country, in Alberta, in Nova Scotia, and especially here in Ontario. Indeed, the entire purpose of the Ecofiscal Commission, which just launched in November, sometimes that's hard to believe, is to provide credible analysis to help policymakers address serious challenges that they are facing now, with solutions that are not just smart in principle, but smart in practice. Climate change is arguably the greatest challenge facing policymakers today, in Canada and around the world. We have finally, finally moved beyond the question of whether we need to significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It is clear that we do. The debate now, and for the near future, is about how best to do it. And this is where our new report begins, with a question that asks, how can we reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Canada in the most cost-effective and practical way? I'd like you to indulge me for a moment, and I, and I really mean it when I ask you for this. I'd like you to close your eyes. I'd like you to close your eyes and imagine just a little something. One dozen policy-savvy economists, generally poorly dressed, with specialties ranging from environmental policy and the sources of innovation to corporate competitiveness and fiscal federalism. Keep your eyes shut. They're all in a room together for two days at a time on a few different meetings, and they're debating the most practical way for Canada to make headway on this crucial issue. Every once in a while, we give them food and we let them recharge their laptops. This is not a pretty picture, but this is exactly what we did. And as you know, economists are often criticized for their inability to reach consensus and for their dismal view about the world. Just parenthetically, I actually think this is an unjustified criticism of economists. We are fabulously positive people and sometimes even well-dressed. But through this process, we found both consensus and optimism about the most practical way forward for Canada to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. For those of you who have not read the report yet, and you really should because it truly is a thing of beauty, let me quickly lay out the highlights because they are directly relevant to the conversation that we are going to have today. Point number one, climate change is costly to Canadians today. From the infestation of the mountain pine beetle in the Western Canadian forests, to the impact on Atlantic fisheries, to the higher costs due to shipping costs due to low water levels in the St. Lawrence, and countless examples in between. There is not a region or sector in Canada that will not be affected by climate change. These costs are only rising over time, and delaying policy action in Canada will simply, simply mean more policy action later. As the world continues moving toward lower carbon economies, it is inevitable that Canada will move too. So what will we choose? Will we ramp up our efforts gradually over time and adapt to a low-carbon economy and reap the benefits from being near the front of this global policy parade? Or will we sit on our hands for another decade, then rush to catch up and put policies in place that shock the economic system? You can guess where we, a group of economists, landed on that question. Canada will benefit significantly by acting sooner rather than later. Point number two. Governments need to make a choice. Every government in Canada has committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and each faces the same two broad options. They can use some form of quantitative or prescriptive regulations, or they can use a market-based approach with pricing at its core. Here is the central difference. By giving businesses and households the financial incentive to produce fewer emissions and the flexibility 
to find the best way to do so. Pricing carbon reduces emissions at the lowest possible cost. Regulations usually can't do this, even when they are relatively well designed. At the same time, and this is arguably the most underappreciated part of carbon pricing, is that it generally generates revenues. This is money that governments can use to create additional economic benefits, whether by reducing corporate or personal income taxes, or by investing in critical infrastructure, or by supporting the development of clean technology. There are several good options. And Canadians need to hold their governments to account for recycling the carbon revenues wisely. But the main point is, regulations don't provide this opportunity at all. As a Commission of Economists, you won't be surprised to learn that our report provides a compelling argument in favor of using carbon pricing rather than regulations to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And for those really geeky policy types among you, we also do a pretty cool modeling exercise that quantifies the benefits of using a carbon pricing approach. But we aren't alone in favoring carbon pricing. There must be some reason why 23 subnational governments and 39 national governments across the globe have either adopted or are in the process of adopting carbon pricing policies. And the number is rising every year. There is certainly global momentum in this direction. Point number three, a textbook version of a carbon price applies a uniform price equally to 100% of greenhouse gas emissions. In this idealized setting, the most efficient approach would be a consistent carbon price in all parts of Canada. Actually, it would be a consistent carbon price in all parts of the world, but that's not yet our reality. A consistent carbon price across the country is certainly a worthwhile goal. It's the most cost-effective, business-friendly, and ultimately effective way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And all levels of government would have roles to play in getting to that ultimate destination. But in Canada, we cannot and we should not ignore the real challenges to a top-down, one-size-fits-all policy. Canada's regions have very different economic structures, energy mixes, and emissions profiles. They really are very different, and too often we forget how important this is. Why do they matter? Because any practical approach to national carbon pricing, whether propelled by provincial or federal leadership, would have to incorporate these differences. These provincial differences frame the challenge for Canadian climate policy, but they need not stand in the way of making progress. Building on the existing momentum with provincial carbon pricing is the first critical step forward. It makes perfect sense to focus on continuing provincial action. British Columbia, Quebec, and Alberta have all implemented different approaches to carbon pricing. And now, Ontario is ready to follow suit. This is called progress. And it is progress that we should not only embrace, but encourage. Our analysis shows that every province across the country stands to gain more from pricing carbon than by using a regulatory alternative to achieve the same emissions reductions. And Canada as a whole stands to gain from independent provincial action. Provinces do not need to wait, not for anyone, not for anything. They can and they should act now. Point number four, the devil, as always, is in the details. There are many choices when designing a carbon pricing policy. How do we ensure the stringency increases over time? What emissions will the policy cover? How do we deal with the competitiveness of businesses? And what is the best way to recycle the revenues? For each of these details, different governments facing different realities are going to make different choices. The carbon pricing system in BC and Quebec, for example, are designed very differently, but they are both good systems. These kinds of provincial differences are central to Canadian policy and have been since Confederation. And they underline the practicality of the provincial approach to carbon pricing. In fact, the provincial approach that the Ecofiscal Commission recommends shouldn't really be surprising at all once you really think about it. It's about as Canadian as a toque in January. These policy details are what we are here to talk about tonight. Ontario has signaled its commitment to move forward with pricing carbon but how it designs that policy is incredibly important. The details will shape the future of Ontario's economy, as well as its success in reducing emissions. Those things matter to everyone in this room, 
and perhaps even more to your children and grandchildren. The business of carbon pricing in Ontario is your business. So let's get this thing started. Moderating this afternoon's discussion is my good friend and colleague, Stuart Elgy. He is not only one of the 12 eco-fiscal commissioners, but he is the chair of Sustainable Prosperity and a highly regarded professor of law at the University of Ottawa. It is my pleasure and honor to welcome Stuart to the stage. Thanks. You probably heard me up front say, Chris, you're a tough act to follow, and he is. Um, I feel very fortunate to be uh, here among all of you today, and, and I mean that literally. Uh, as I was packing to leave for the airport, um, I discovered my toddler had taken the various cards and IDs out of my wallet and shoved them into a little crack in the wall. Uh, I only found that after searching frantically for them for about five minutes, and he grabbed me by the hand and pointed and said, Daddy, in there. Anyway, thank God for those uh, plastic yardsticks. Um, so I'm here. Uh, what does that have to do with anything? Well, let me segue from that in some way to this quote on the wall. Um, can you, anyone read that? Okay. Price signal, powerful incentive, enhance energy efficiency, innovation, new technology, position Canadian firms in the global economy. Put that up on the screen for my students sometimes, and I ask them who said it, and usually get answers like Al Gore or me if they're sucking up for marks. Um, but uh, who said it, of course, if you want to click the next uh, forward, is the Canadian Council of Chief Executives in 2010. Uh, and to me, what's powerful about that is it also might have been said by Al Gore or David Suzuki. There's a remarkable alignment of interest and understanding that carbon pricing and environmental pricing generally is critical to drive the economy in a direction that will both be more efficient and innovative and also more environmentally responsible. And the CCC, of course, wasn't alone in saying that. One of the striking things in the last couple of years is there have been a series of reports by the world's most respected economic authorities saying basically the same thing. World Economic Forum, OECD, World Bank, McKinsey, um, and many others have put out reports more or less saying similar things about that and talking about, talking about that in the context of the global economic shift towards an economy that will reward firms that are cleaner, more eco-innovative, use natural capital in a productive way, and use energy efficiently. This global shift is not only a responsibility, it's a tremendous opportunity for Ontario and Canada's economy and all parts of the economy. Firms in the clean sector, clean tech sector, face the opportunity of getting part of a growing clean technology, low carbon market that's expected to reach about $2 trillion a year within five years. That's a lot of trillions. Um, but it's not just the clean tech firms. In the resource and manufacturing sector, it's becoming critically important for firms to lower their environmental footprint to gain, a, uh, to gain market advantage. We've seen that in forestry, we're seeing it now in oil and gas. Not only to gain competitive edge, though, but also to gain a share of a growing market. McKinsey's report, Resource Revolution, talks about $2.9 trillion in spending on resource efficiency and innovation by 2030. So th this is really an important point. I find often when I talk about greener growth or greening the economy, people tend to think it means windmills and electric cars and organic broccoli and stuff like that. And it does mean that stuff. But the world is also going to continue to buy natural resources, manufactured products, and other things. And those are great strengths of Canada's economy. So to me, one of the key questions is, what's our niche for Ontario and for Canada in a market that's moving in the direction that all of these economic authorities think? And of course, there are many niches, but I think one of the best ones and one of the most promising ones is to position ourselves across all parts of the economy as a leader in environmentally responsible production. It would be great to see Made in Canada with one of those green maple leaves up there as an internationally recognized brand of environmental leadership, whether it be for clean tech, agriculture, energy, or resources. That's a goal we should strive to and we can meet. How do we get there? Well, big question. We'll talk a little bit about that today. Mostly it will be through private action. Most of the innovation and entrepreneurship will come from the private sector. But as Dick Lipsy is fond of saying, every major technology innovation in the last 100 years has had a significant investment and support from government at some stage of its life cycle. The private sector alone does not drive innovation, although it's critical. 
we need government policy to enable and support those changes and to remove some of the barriers that get in the way. So it will take a mix of policies and investments. It will take investments in next generation smart infrastructure, transit, electrical grids. It will take smarter regulations. Yes, that dirty word regulations that economists hate, but things like building efficiency standards, fuel efficiency standards for vehicles are an important part of the policy mix. It will take strategic public investments to leverage and spur private investment in places where the market alone isn't doing it. But most of all, the central platform of any of these policy packages has got to be carbon pricing. The good news is, as Chris mentioned, Canada's already moving on that front. We've got three provinces that have had carbon pricing systems in place for several years. The sky hasn't fallen, by the way. Um, uh, and they've actually worked pretty well. Uh, the research we put out last year on BC's carbon tax shift, for example, talks about in the five years since it was put into place, BC's fuel use has gone down by 16%, while it's gone up by 3% in the rest of Canada. It's a pretty big improvement. Especially when you keep in mind our 6% reduction target under Kyoto was considered to be economically challenging. And at the same time, BC's GDP has slightly outperformed the rest of Canada during this per that period, and it's got the lowest tax rates in the country because of the tax shift. So while it's had some effects across the economy, the winners and losers as any shift, carbon pricing, if you do it right, can actually be good for the environment and the economy. The challenge in Canada is we need to spread this out across the country and build on that momentum. How we design carbon pricing so that it meets our climate targets in Ontario and positions us to prosper in a changing global economy is what today's session is about. And we've got uh, several people who are very qualified to talk to you about that subject. And if I may call them up to stage, come on up and I'll embarrass you by saying how great you are. If you don't come up, I won't say how great you are. So there's a, the carrot and stick, just like carbon pricing. Um, so. Uh, in, in no particular order as they play musical chairs, David Patterson is uh, General Motors Vice President, Corporate Environmental Affairs, also works as part of GM's Global Public Policy and Communications Division. Many positions before that, Senior Vice President with BlackBerry, Senior Vice President with Manulife, and he's currently Vice Chair of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, which has actually taken some, done some really good thinking about carbon climate policy. Michael Masweeney is the President and CEO of the Cement Association of Canada, um, he's been in that position since 2010, uh, several years prior to that, other, other positions in the industry. He's had senior positions in a variety of companies, including CEO of the Canadian Standards Council. He's been a city councillor in my hometown of Ottawa. Uh, and he was executive assistant to the Prime Minister of Canada, Honourable Brian Mulroney. Um, next to Michael is Dr. Vicky Sharp. Uh, Vicky has had many roles, uh, including most recently being a strategic advisor to Sustainable Development Technology Canada. Uh, she has just been appointed, I understand, a senior fellow of the International Institute for Sustainable, Sustainable Development, but, which is a mouthful to say, um, she's probably best known in recent years as the founder, president and CEO of Sustainable Development Technology Canada, which is a remarkable organization. Um, it has built an internationally around, internationally around global clean tech industry in Canada, increased public funding from 2001 from $100 million to $1.4 billion, mobilized more than $4.3 billion of investments from the private sector. Before that, she was a CEO of other companies. She is on far too many boards to mention, and she has received too many awards for her environmental economy leadership to mention, but they're all here if you want them, and she deserves every one of them, I can tell you from knowing her in person. Um, Craig Alexander also deserves some awards, um, but I don't know all the ones he has. He is a senior vice president and chief economist with the TD Bank Group, manages a large team of economists supporting all divisions of the bank, which is the second largest in Canada. Uh, 15 years of experience in the private sector. He is a frequent commentator on public policy and economic issues, directs research on a wide array of subjects, um, comments in the media. Uh, near and dear to my heart as an academic, he's on the editorial board of the Canadian Public Policy Journal um, and two-term president of Canadian Association for Business Economics. So a renaissance man. Um, now, Joanna probably has an order, so I better stick with it or I'll get in big trouble. So, Michael, uh, I'm to call you to make uh, two-minute remarks first, then we're going to go through and every one of the panelists are just going to open up by saying a couple of minutes on their perspective on this issue, and we're going to turn that into a back-and-forth discussion for half an hour or so. So, Michael, may I ask you to lead, and then we'll talk to David, Vicky, and Craig. Great. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Stuart. Uh, you know, as one of uh, the world's uh, largest final emitters, I'm sure many of you are 
you know, puzzled to see us sponsoring uh, this session and uh, uh, along with sustainable prosperity. Uh, but for the last uh, five or six years at the Cement Association, I've had the pleasure of not uh, dragging our multinational CEOs kicking and screaming uh, in the direction of uh, doing something on climate change, but they're actually leading, they're applauding, they're cheering, and they're asking us to do all we can uh, in support of, uh, of making this world uh, a much better, a much cleaner place. Since 2007, uh, when Quebec came out with the first carbon levy, when Alberta introduced uh, the uh, technology fund to 2008 in British Columbia, uh, with the carbon tax to 2013, uh, with Quebec cap and trade coming into place, and now under the leadership of Glenn Murray, who just uh, walked in, um, and the Wynn government, we're going to see similar actions here in, uh, here in Ontario. But we're not Johnny come lately to this. We have uh, been uh, taking action on this around uh, the world and here in Canada, you know, since uh, about 2000. And it's something that we take uh, a, a lot of pride in. In fact, we're one of the only industries in Ontario that are actually asking government to move on climate change. As for what pricing model works, uh, well, we're an energy intensive trade exposed industry. Um, you know, so it has to be a little bit more accommodating, a little bit more delicate when you're designing a, a price on carbon, especially when we're looking at, uh, at uh, products that flow uh, in, into and out of the United States or, or from Asia. So we do need to uh, have some sort of harmonization uh, to protect our industry at the, at the outset. Uh, price signal is also very important, but it's not uh, sufficient. I think you mentioned that, Stuart. We're going to need step change and massive government policy interventions if we're going to get to the levels of uh, reductions uh, by 2050. Um, you know, we at the, at, at the Cement Association always want to make sure people understand you're, you're standing or sitting on concrete. <laughs> Cement is a powder. There is only one product that cement goes into, and that is concrete. So you mix cement powder with water, sand, and gravel, and you get concrete. Cement uh, basically uh, produces about 750 um, tons of GHGs for uh, every ton of, uh, uh, 750 kilograms of uh, GHGs for every ton of cement. Uh, but when you take that down and you put it into the concrete, it goes in at about 10%. So we're down to about 75 kilograms of, uh, of uh, GHGs for a ton of concrete. So we, we're really not um, you know, as evil as some people think we are. And if we are going to make the, the uh, changes um, to climate adaptation, if we're going to continue to build cities like Toronto, if we're going to continue to invest in infrastructure and uh, public transportation and uh, hydroelectricity, we're going to have to rely on a foundational product like concrete. As much as the wood industry would like to see their product being used, they can't use them in foundational products uh, and systems the way we can. So we're, we're here, we're here to make a difference. We want to be part of the change, we want to be part of the solution, and we're very proud to do that. Thanks, Michael. David, you go over to you. Well, uh, let me sort of wave the flag for uh, the Ontario auto industry. It, you may have heard General Motors has been through a few things, but we're back, and we're <laughs> profitable, and we love being here in Ontario and growing. Um, and uh, just to share some perspective, one thing that never changed in General Motors is that we really come to this whole issue with a key perspective, which is that uh, tackling climate change is something we've got to get on with, and it's something that is an economic opportunity. And we look at it this way, and that's what we look at this exercise is very much being as, a, as an opportunity. Um, 
the, so we welcome the report and we welcome the process that Ontario is going through. And we want to be part of that and make a meaningful contribution. And I think there's two key areas of opportunity that are important from our sector and, and for us at uh, General Motors. One is we're very proud of our auto plants here. Big part of the industrial capacity of, uh, of Ontario. Uh, but they are absolutely brilliant performers right across our sector in terms of uh, greenhouse gas reduction. And we do that in all kinds of ways in terms of, uh, of this equation of, uh, of good efficiency is good business. Uh, a quick example, uh, a lot of people might be surprised to hear that our three auto plants here in, in Ontario are landfill free. What does that mean for greenhouse gases? Well, Oshawa is actually 5% away from being landfill free. That's pretty good. But uh, what that does is it actually cuts our greenhouse gases from our plants by 50% from all those uh, uh, dump trucks that uh, don't pull things away. And there's a bonus as well because when we recycle the metals from our plants, we make about $30 million a year from that. There's an economic benefit in that and there's a lot more opportunity in those plants if we construct policies correctly because if we further reduce our electricity costs and our, our gas costs, we save money and we get more competitive. And so that's an important opportunity, happy to talk more about that. The other thing that affects us all is the vehicles on the road. And vehicles on the road in Ontario, that's about 18% of our overall greenhouse gases at the moment. So we're proud uh, at General Motors to be Canada's largest seller of electric cars. The Chevrolet Volt's been four years the leading seller. And we have three in the marketplace, three electric vehicles. And we love the fact that there's going to be competition like crazy over the next five years to bring forward new technologies uh, that, uh, that people can adapt and make a meaningful difference. It comes on the background of a regulated sector to deliver fuel economy, and we'll do that pretty much in the trajectory of what we need to do in Ontario, but we can do more. And the real opportunity here in this process is that all of you as purchasers of vehicles and all of our customers can be helped if we design this the right way to see additional incentives to move over into an electric car, to look at things like how we, uh, we look at the, the price of charging. And what better thing than an electric car in a province where we've already got a low greenhouse gas electricity system, be it here or in, in Quebec. So we see opportunity in those particular areas and uh, we're gonna participate. Thanks very much. Vicki. So thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here today and very much so listening to that crescendo of discussion around pricing carbon. It's taken so long and I think we're at a point now where there's been sufficient discussion, uh, certainly better elucidated by the work of the Ecofiscal Commission and others, that we can comprehend what needs to be done, that we can take action and um, I'm sure there will be debate about whether it should be a carbon tax or whether it should be cap and trade. I just think we should stop debating things and do things because we are significantly missing out on the global opportunity to improve Canada's economic performance. At the same time, it will be an improvement on its environmental performance. Uh, but I look at what uh, our Canadian companies can do and I am worried that we will be left behind. We are an export-oriented nation. Uh, we have to derive those revenues. There is um, a market that, as you said, Stuart, anywhere between one and, and four trillion has been assessed for 2020. Uh, Canada currently has about 1% share of that market. Uh, we have 700 clean tech companies in Canada. That's um, you know, in the order of 11 billion in revenues and 40 odd thousand jobs. If we were just to double our share of the global market uh, and take a conservative estimate that it would be only a trillion dollars by 2020, that will translate into 125,000 jobs and about 60 billion in revenues. That is as big as some of our most significant economic sectors in this country. And so uh, why would we not want to embrace this and look at it as an opportunity and stop worrying about uh, whether we should or we shouldn't? Admittedly, the details are important, but let's uh, you know, move on with this uh, because it uh, is exciting and it'll, it'll bring great rewards for, for us as a nation. 
Uh, two other points that go around that is that we've had for many years these discussions on why isn't Canada more productive? Why aren't we more competitive? And uh, hand-wringing over business expenses on research and development, the numbers aren't high enough. Well, the, the thing is, is we have not seen enough energy efficient and clean technologies adopted and the products purchased uh, by Canadian companies yet. If you look at the amount of overhang of unplaced capital that Canada is sitting on relative to the US, it's massive um, proportionally. And we need to be able to invest that money. And in doing so, those technologies will make us more productive uh, and competitive. And it will also help us to diversify uh, our economy. So some of these technologies, Stuart, as you said, were applicable to traditional industries, whether that be oil and gas or forestry but it's also able to generate new revenue streams from different businesses that we haven't fully contemplated. So if we can increase our competitiveness, move up the value chain so that we're not just a resource-based uh, economy and diversify and grab some of that export uh, opportunity, I can't see why we don't just move now. <laughs> well. It's a good segue to you, Craig. Um, I have to say, listening to Chris's opening remarks, my, my, my first thought was I, I didn't realize he was so risk-loving. You know, he told you to close your eyes and picture a room of 12 economists <laughs> working over several days. I'm like, oh my god, the audience is going to go to sleep. <laughs> right? um, but in fact, the work that TD Economics has been doing basically echoes a lot of what the Ecofiscal Commission has presented in their analysis. Um, I went back and looked, and our first, our first report in this area was on market-based solutions to protect the environment, and it was done in 2007. So it's been a long time that, that my team has been talking about this issue, because we do think it's terribly important. In 2009, we looked at the question that we didn't think people had an answer to, which was, can you put a price on carbon and still have a growing economy? And the conclusion we reached is that, yes, you can, right? That ultimately putting a price on carbon does not, does not lead to derailing the Canadian economy. You can still have growth and prosperity. Um, and more recently, we've been looking at the greening of the economy, looking at the progress that's being made. I think our, our, our concern is, and this is something that's, that's, that's highlighted in the Ecofiscal Commission work, is that even the progress we're making, and you're seeing it in a lot of different industries, right? A lot of greening taking place outside of the narrow definitions of, of what's a green industry. You're seeing broad-based movement, but we're still not actually going to meet the targets that we've set out. And if you're going to fall short, that means you have to ask a question whether you need to do more. And I think the, con the inevitable conclusion is yes you, yes, yes, you do. More recently, we've been looking at the value of natural capital. And part of our thesis is that when businesses and governments are making decisions, they look at in terms of like, okay, so what's the investment going to be in terms of labor, machinery, and capital? But maybe really what you should also be including is the value of natural capital, and it's something that needs to be more embedded in the decision-making process. So as an economist, when I, when, I, when I look at this issue and think about carbon pricing, um, you know, part of the, the setup for this panel was, you know, please bring your unique perspective. Well, it's not going to sound very unique because it's going to sound an awful lot like what Chris just articulated, right? So the first what question that any economist is going to ask is, is there a legitimate problem here? And the answer is, yes, there is. Carbon emissions are having an environmental impact. Question number two is, is there a market failure, right? Is, is, is the market not capable of addressing the issue? And the answer is very clear that market pricing is not capturing the cost of the environment of carbon emissions. Well, that's a really important answer, because if that's true, then there is absolutely a role for public policy to pay, play in addressing the market failure, which then leads to the, the operational question. OK, so now what do you do about it? And your options are relatively, you know, they're broad and narrow at the same time. If you put them in big, big categories, you can regulate it, or you can try to use market-based mechanisms to address it, either through putting a price on it, you know, through a tax, or coming up with a market-based solution, like a cap-and-trade cap program. I think that the economic literature is unambiguous that purely trying to regulate this, like could you come up with regulations that would achieve the target? Probably, but if you did, it would come at a much higher cost than if you used a diversified set of policy tools. 
And ultimately, that involves that likely involves some regulation. It involves some taxes. It likely involves some subsidies. It also involves putting a price on carbon, whether that's a carbon tax or a cap and trade system. Then the question becomes, you know, which level of government should be involved, right? If there's a pol if there's a if there's a market failure and there's a role for government to play, what gov what level of government should be involved? And the answer is every level of government, you know, in various different ways. Um, I'll be honest, when we did our initial TD assessment on the impact on the economy, we actually made a major mistake because when we did the recycling of the money that was being captured by putting a price on carbon, we actually didn't recycle it back fully into the provinces where the money was being collected. And there was a legitimate pushback on our, on our, on our modeling because while the national numbers were perfectly fine, there was an in inequity being created at the provincial level. And this is one of the reasons why I really like what the Ecofiscal Commission has done in terms of putting the emphasis at the provincial level. From an efficiency point of view, a textbook would tell you a national price on carbon makes, the, makes imminent sense. And businesses have to compete across all the regions in Canada. And so a level playing field helps businesses to compete. But even if you had a national price in some way, you would still have to take provincial considerations into account. And that was my biggest lesson from our 2009 study, beyond the fact putting a price on carbon was not inconsistent with economic growth. So I think at the end of the day, you know, what I would stress is that the Ecofiscal Commission is doing something very, very useful in terms of raising the dialogue around the issue. But more importantly, what it's doing is it's actually putting the emphasis at the right, in the right place. And what we really need to do is get the ball moving, right? You know, we started talking about this in 2007. We talked about the economic impact in 2009. And we've known for a long time that we're not going to actually, uh, we're not on the right track to hit the targets. And to, to Chris's point, and I really hate to be a broken record in just taking his material, but at the end of the day, the longer you wait, the, the only thing is his material echoed what we said years before. Um, <laughs> The, the point is, the longer you wait, the higher the cost gets. And the sooner you get businesses to start actually understanding how to operate in, 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 a, in a, low car, a lower carbon environment, the easier it is going to be to adapt. And now, you know what? I think we actually underestimate the, adapt, the adaptability of the economy and businesses. I think my one big criticism is that we really need to think about this as in, a, in, a in a transformative way. Right? We need to actually get businesses and, and individuals to actually understand what the vision of the future looks like and get them to understand that it's a prosperous future. Right? This isn't a threat. This is actually putting a price on something that a price isn't being put on today. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Well, clearly nobody has any views on this issue up here. Um, so. <laughs> We've got uh, about 20 minutes for a bit of a back and forth. Um, and um, what I thought I'd start out with is a question that some of you have already touched on, but maybe let's elaborate a little bit more, which is what are the opportunities that we should be trying to grab onto here? The next question is going to be about the challenges, just to kind of get yourself ready. And in specifically, you guys have each talked about certain opportunities, but let's link those opportunities to what we need to do in terms of designing climate policy to best embrace those opportunities. And let's maybe try to stick to kind of, let's keep it quick, one minute answers, maybe just have everyone go through and give one thought. What's your one, one advice in terms of key things we should be doing to grab opportunities for Ontario's economy in this new policy reform? We'll have to take a first whack at that one. Well, I think the biggest problem is we don't actually start the discussion in terms of, in terms of the opportunities. Okay. Right? I mean, I actually think that most of the dialogue starts off with, well, what's the cost going to be? Who's this going to affect negatively? So let's start how this bad is this going to be? So opportunities right? we are. How do we, how do we get them? Well, in terms of opportunities, like TD became, you know, one of the lessons we've learned, and I actually heard it from the panelists, is when you actually start to do things that reduce, reduce your carbon emissions, you often actually find opportunities that you never saw before. Yeah. And one of the things our environmental group within TD does is they run pilot projects where they go into a business and say, how about trying this? Because we actually think that if you do this, you'll, you'll re, you, know, we, you know, we have a mandate that we have to be carbon neutral. We need you to go do this. There's some resistance. Run a pilot project. And you know what? After two years, invariably the business actually realizes, hey, there was actually an opportunity there we didn't see. So actually identifying the opportunities, like just saying, like, what are the opportunities is actually a little hard in the sense that 
until you actually start down the path, you often don't even realize what all the opportunities that are present. Okay, so anyone else? What, and particularly, what does it mean for policy design for climate policy? How do we design climate policy that maximizes our chance to get those opportunities? Well, I'll, I'll bring it down to the plant level, um, where there is, there is an opportunity, and it's, uh, take a challenge to start with. Uh, one thing we know well is that uh, in Ontario, we have a challenge in terms of the high price of electricity for those of us that are producing. But on the flip side, this may offer a very significant opportunity for those of us that have to compete for investment, not just against other provinces, but across the border to the south. So my competition is in Michigan and uh, in, in Illinois and places like that uh, for investment. Uh, and my electricity prices are about 10% more than they are in, in Michigan. Now, if uh, in the recycling of some of the dividend here, and in some of the policies that we do, if we can find incentives to help us get the last mile in terms of additional reductions in electricity use, if, in terms of additional gas uses and the like, we can actually close that gap to our key competitor. Everybody's moving on this, everybody's uh, working very hard, but if we can get some additional uh, policy uh, uh, incentives or what have you for us to be able to make the investment to now bring down our electricity cost even further, we get that double win. We get uh, reduced greenhouse gases, but we also get competitiveness. Big opportunity against a challenge that everybody is whining about. So let's get on with it. <laughs> I'll, I'll take the how. Uh, you know, first, uh, our industry believes in a, in a cap and trade uh, system. Uh, we really believe that you can deliver uh, guaranteed results you know, when you set uh, the cap. In looking at uh, the Ecofiscal Commission report today, if we look at the uh, carbon tax in British Columbia, we see that only 70% of the emissions are captured under a carbon tax. But if we contrast that to Quebec, when we look at um, once they included the fuel distributors uh, under their cap and trade uh, system, 85% of the emissions were captured. So from you know, that perspective, I, I think that uh, you can deliver actual, actual results. Um, you know, I think that uh, we can really uh, focus on what do we do with the revenues from a cap and trade system. I think they need to be dedicated um, to spe specific areas of government. It should never go to general revenue. Uh, some of it should go to the Trillium Fund, for example, for uh, um, infrastructure renewal and public transit. Uh, this is done in Quebec um, where they, uh, with their green fund, uh, where they dedicate a certain amount of money to certain projects. In California, uh, revenues are targeted to infrastructure, social housing, that kind of thing. And then, you know, about a third of it goes into the long term. Um, the long-term development of technologies, you know, from now to 2050. And we need to have a fund that will get monies invested in research and development that are going to uh, uh, produce the, uh, the, the technologies that we need in the future to reduce, uh, to make the deep emission cuts we want by 2050. Vicky, that sounds like a good segue to you, having run that exact type of fund uh, at the national level. What's your experience in terms of you know, a heretical idea that government, in, as an investor, can actually play a critical role in driving clean innovation and low carbon growth? Yeah, Any yeah. lessons learned? Uh, very much so. I mean, first of all, if you're going to ask people to act, then you should empower them. And providing solutions through different kinds of products is, is great. Uh, you should, uh, whatever you do in terms of governance, that entity should be very private sector oriented, but monitored uh, to deliver, ensure it's delivering results broadly. Um, SDTC has been able to leverage one public dollar 14 times uh, with private dollars, which shows a, a really good engagement. Uh, the cost benefit analysis that was done in 2011 showed nine times um, benefit versus one to cost, so nine to one ratio um, benefit to cost. Uh, you um, need to engage people, and I was going to actually make a broader point, which is that whatever Ontario decides to do, it has to engage um, uh, the broader popular citizenry need to be able to see what's going on. They will then vote that way, they will then understand it. 
Um, and if you have a broad range of technologies, and, and Ontario's opportunities are in residential, commercial, uh, in manufacturing, and in transportation, all of them key issues for, for the province. So you can focus your technology solutions in those arenas. Uh, one other point is, is that innovation is an ecosystem. And people tend to talk about R&D. SDTC was in demonstration and deployment. Whatever you do, make sure that you are um, supporting uh, investment and more rapid uh, delivery of results from end to end across that innovation ecosystem. Because if you press one button and you don't get commercial product, then you haven't delivered value. So, um, and I would think that the results that STTC has been able to demonstrate uh, are sufficiently strong that a portion of uh, capital um, being recycled, whether from auctioning permits or, or um, a taxation levy, absolutely should go to this area of endeavor. Interesting. So I'm just writing down, I've got three eyes from just listening to those conversations. So we've got, first is investment or in incentives, that the incentives created by a carbon price push us in the right direction. But the revenues from that can be used for infrastructure, uh, clean infrastructure, which helps actually drive the economy in the direction we want, and interestingly, for investment. Um, and there is a role, it sounds like, for, for smart government investment. And I'd like your, work, your word about focusing and picking priorities, because obviously we're not going to be a world leader in every single niche. Mm -hmm. So picking where our comparative advantage are makes a lot of sense. Um, we had, uh, David said a little bit about the challenges sides. So maybe just sort of let's build on that a little bit. That obviously any kind of economic transition, whether it be free trade or shifting to a low carbon economy, even if it produces a better endpoint, is going to have transitions along the way. So what can we do to manage some of those challenges in designing a carbon pricing policy? Uh, I think you have to try and get it right from, from day one. And that, that uh, only comes from stakeholder engagement, uh, as, as uh, Vicky said. I mean, I think uh, Minister Murray has done the absolute right thing in appointing the Climate Action Group here. If we, if we contrast that with what happened in British Columbia, where you know uh, Gordon Campbell fell in love with Arnold Schwarzenegger and they wrote the carbon tax plan on the back of an envelope and an announced it you know, the next day. Now I'm simplifying it a, a little bit, but there certainly was no broad consultation. Um, I think it's important that we look at industry by industry. You know, we're here in the financial district. This isn't the be all and end all of Canada. As Vicky also mentioned, we are a natural resource based um, uh, country. And so you have to, under, government needs to understand the different industries and the effects that a carbon price will have on those industries. Um, if I look at British Columbia, and, uh, it, you know, for example, one of the unintended consequences of the carbon tax was um, in 2008, imports from Asia of cement, remember cement is like a baby powder, the, in, the imports from Asia were 6%. Last year, they were close to 40%. So all we did in British Columbia was leak our GHGs to Asia. And then we created another 25% greenhouse gases, bringing them back to Vancouver by shipping. Now, it's taken me six years to convince, uh, you know, now two governments that we need some sort of relief and we finally, in this budget, got a $27 million uh, transitional fund for the cement industry, which will help, um, help it re uh, reduce its reliance on coal and you know, get onto these new technologies that are, are going to be vitally important uh, to uh, the future. But again, you know, talk, to, talk to the community. It's great to see environmental defense here. It's great to see community groups here. Uh, the government really needs and is doing the right thing by engaging citizens, business, uh, and community groups in this carbon pricing discussion. Okay, now just to be clear, you do not want to close your eyes and imagine Gordon Campbell falling in love with Arnold Schwarzenegger? Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah. Keep our eyes wide open right now because those economists are going to look awfully boring compared to that one. Um, so segueing away from it, your word transition was interesting to me. And one of the challenges I think of, of dealing with the challenges and, and the economic buffering it talks about is how do we actually manage it in a way that it is a transitional solution, that we actually 
buffer firms, but also help them invest and prepare for this kind of low carbon economic future that people seem to agree is a reality. We don't, we don't want long term carbon welfare either. So how do we turn this challenge into a transition towards an opportunity? Well, I think part of the issue is when, when, when you're embarked on, on carbon pricing, you also have to give, uh, you know, have a runway in terms of giving businesses an opportunity to, ad to adapt and change. Okay. You're going to be creating a lot of fiscal revenue from putting a price on carbon. And the, the point that was made, which I completely agree with, is this actually creates a lot of opportunities. One of the pitfalls is you have to make sure it doesn't go into general revenues and it gets recycled back in. And this is actually core to l reducing the economic impact on making the transition. And how you use the fiscal recycling is terribly important. And, and part of it needs to go into helping companies adapt. And what we need to do is make sure that in terms of the dialogue, it's not a dialogue of the good guys and the bad guys, right? There, you know, that, isn't, that isn't a useful conversation, nor is it going to be an economically viable one. So we need to, we need to put a price on. We need, to get it, we need to get the price in place. And we may, over time, need to actually ramp it up. Perhaps give a roadmap as to when the price is going to increase over time so that basically businesses can build it into their business models and figure out how they're going to be competitive and succeed in, in, that, in, that, new, in that new environment. Because as I said, businesses are actually capable of adapting to an awful lot um, if, if they have the time and they understand where, where they're actually going. And I do think it also has to be terribly inclusive. Like, you know, this is a dialogue that has to include everybody. The other challenge, though, is I think no one has actually done an effective job of actually articulating what a low carbon economy in 20 years actually looks like. And I'd really like to see somebody actually deliver that, because I've never actually read one. Um, so at the end of the day, if you can do that, you could actually get a lot more buy-in from the general public and from businesses. David, I I'd like to see that, too. Uh, the, uh, it, it's incredibly complex and it is going to be a challenge in developing the, the, the policies because there is so much interrelation between our businesses. And we've talked, about, we've talked about the challenge of competitiveness and making sure that we don't do this in a way that puts us at a competitive disadvantage and we get the opposite of what we're looking for. Uh, we also talked about uh, the fact that all of us as consumers uh, interact in a lot of these ways. One example uh, uh, that's often quoted from the auto industry, we do have a set of fuel economy regulations. They're set. And we're going to see a 50% improvement in fuel economy in all our vehicles on average across the board by 2025. And that's great. There's a huge technology revolution that's taking place. Sounds like the perfect uh, solution. The problem is that in setting out that one challenge as a solution in the auto sector, we forgot there's a bunch of other factors. Someone famously made the, the quote that sort of like saying we're all a little bit overweight, we've got to lose some, some weight, and so the solution is everyone will wear, will wear 32 inch pants. The problem is that we also need to look at a whole bunch of other factors. And, and so in the auto sector, um, uh, having people incentivized to make the change, we have people here that have worked a lot, for instance, in getting old vehicles off the road. A third of the vehicles on our road here in, in Ontario are over 10 years old. That's really old technology. And so actually what we need to do is upgrade the technology. And I'd love it if we could get a, a ton of it into electric cars, but lightweight materials and all kinds of things are going to be part of that problem. So our policy challenge is not only going to engage us in the companies, it's going to engage you as drivers or takers of public transit, uh, looking at uh, ways and it's going to change business models. And so all of these things interact, and uh, we really have to have a good discussion to make it an effective outcome. Vicky, you want to, anything to add to that? It, yes, I, I'd like to, uh, much as we'd like to have it right the first time, I suspect we well, won't. Uh, we need to start, maybe start more carefully and then ramp up in a predictable way. Uh, that does still give us timelines to follow for industry to respond. But we won't get it absolutely right to begin with, and it shouldn't be an excuse for not starting. Whatever is done needs to be uh, uh, stuck to. And there's been plenty of studies to show that if um, uh, governments uh, put in place some kind of initiative or regulation and they take it away and then they put it back in again, that they actually cost them three times more for that to actually then take place. Uh, I think your vision point is fabulous um, because 
that would help uh, people appreciate what they are investing in because the people of Ontario will be investing uh, directly in this. Um, for example, I have a real problem with urban sprawl. Mm -hmm. uh, it bothers the heck out of me and we're building all over wonderful agricultural land in, in southern Ontario. So there's lots that we could tackle to look at that people can get behind. And um, I think there are, there are points in the uh, report uh, that are absolutely critical. They have to be broad capacity so that industries can respond, don't have it too narrow a, a focus. Uh, so um, that provides flexibility for industry. Um, and uh, there has to be an increasing stringency. Very good point that was made in the report. Yeah. Has the, to the, the, the one thing I should have added is, you know, we also need to measure the progress. We need to measure what's, you know, we ne need to measure the money that's being collected. We need to measure how it's getting used. We need to measure the impact it's having. We need to measure the progress towards the target. You know, at the end of the day, from a business point of view, what measured gets done and gets evaluated. And so one of the problems we also have in this space is we actually don't have necessarily the measurement tools in place. So a bunch of really important points, and it sounds like some agreement. So uh, key words I had down were economy-wide, Michael emphasized that, price uh, signal across the economy, um, ramping it up so that there's a signal for future investment, um, uh, predictable, um, that predictability really matters for long-term investment. Um, alignment, this is interesting to your point, that, that you want to make sure that all the different parts of government are pushing signals in the same direction. If we want to make uh, cleaner cars, people should have an incentive to buy cleaner cars at the same time. Um, uh, transition, the idea that there will be a transition and the early years of, of, of adaptation are tough and that transition should shift into an investment and opportunity. And interestingly, you all seem to agree that nesting that in some vision of where we're going and, and the opportunities of part of that is really important. Um, Chris is going to uh, come up on stage in a few minutes, but I thought I might just give everyone um, a shot for a last word on this. Um, key thoughts that you'd like to leave the audience or the, or the minister with uh, as you go about why we should do this or what we should do. Just quick thoughts. If I start off, I'd say uh, it's uh, smart to put a value on carbon. Um, the, we have to take cost efficient approaches. The range in cost per ton, if I buy an a offset in Quebec, can be $30. For us, putting an electric car together is in the range of $250 per ton. So we got to find the mix uh, that, uh, that makes a difference. The, the policy decided on the recycling opportunities can be a great opportunity. And we have to keep in mind jurisdictional competitiveness, not just across Canada, but because we compete with other jurisdictions all around the world, we've got to make sure that those are, uh, are properly aligned. Price carbon, price it now, build the um, value over time, uh, engage the citizenry, recycle the capital, focus it on areas that are relevant to Ontario, but allow industry to respond and trade globally, uh, and let's stop fighting it. I remember back in the, was it the 80s, when the appliance industry in Ontario fought the increased energy efficiency standards. There are no manufacturers of white goods in Ontario now. So let's embrace it and let's enjoy. And I don't think governments should be afraid to regulate where they have to regulate. You know, there are going to be some things that uh, uh, we'll be able to do as we tackle climate change uh, from a, a transportation perspective, an industry perspective, and a buildings perspective. And that's the, the first time we're really seeing a government in Canada uh, uh, tackle uh, this challenge from all three sectors and, and not just on the backs of industry. But there are going to be opportunities for government to regulate and they should regulate um, if it is going to um, have a demonstrable change to behavior. Uh, if I look at landfills here today in Ontario, you know, the tr just go to any landfill and watch the trucks show up and they're, they're just showing up, you know, minute after minute. If government said, you know, we're going to triple the cost of the tipping fee at landfill, we would see new industries and new innovation come. So there's a time for government to regulate. And, uh, you know, when we're dealing with climate change, I think that that's the time that they need to be tough on regulation as well. Or strong there you go, there you go Chris. Your next report, price waste. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, last word. Um, 
there's going to be people that don't agree with putting a price on carbon. They're going to push back. They're going to say that you know it's going to come with a very significant economic cost. They're not going to be you know aligned with with the views in the report. But understand that ultimately putting a price on carbon is actually about creating a prosperous future. Mm -hmm. That's actually where we get to. It is inevitable that Canada is going to have to put a price on carbon. The only question is whether we're going to be a leader or a follower. And so being a leader actually makes infinite sense. And the last thing I'd say is go read the report. Because mm. I'll guarantee you most of the opposition is going to come from people that mm -hmm. don't read it. Absolutely. Well, be a leader is a good segue to invite our leader back up to the stage here. While you're walking up, my little plug is if you want the two-page version of carbon pricing, there's a couple of briefing notes by Sustainable Prosperity on the way out. Over to you, Chris. Thank you all very much. Craig, the read the report pitch right at the end. Beautiful. Beautiful. So lots of, lots of good bits and pieces here. Um, um, with Michael McSweeney, we were reminded that while few of us can walk on water, we can all walk on cement and we do it every day. <laughs> and we should keep that in mind. And, I, and I'm not sure if this is quite the way you said it, but what I heard you say was, we don't need Arnold Schwarzenegger when we've got Glenn Murray. I, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the best way. Minister, is that? I, I think that's. I'm pretty sure that's what we heard. Um, from David Patterson, we love competition in the market for electric vehicles. That's what I heard. I love this. Mm -hmm. um, and three GM plants are currently landfill free. So you're right. We should write a report on landfill pricing, and it will come. Um, Vicky talked about the side, the opportunities in the clean sector. Right? Of course, there's opportunities in the clean sector. There's, there's op opportunities in other sectors as well. But she talked about how tiny it is. 40,000 jobs currently in the clean tech sector. Just so you know how small that is, in a typical month, in a good, you know, reasonably good business cycle, a typical month in the country has employment gains of 15,000. So 40,000 is three months worth of typical employment gains. Very, very small. So if we double that, or if we double the share that Canada has in the global market, um, huge opportunity there. Uh, Craig talked about the need to get the ball rolling. Vicky said as well. I was intrigued by the tension between two things that Craig said. One is we need to do a better job envisioning what the future looks like. But at the same time, we can't get too hung up uh, with the fact that we don't know what these innovations are going to look like. And this is a classic uh, thing that economists say at cocktail parties that leaves everybody massively disappointed when people <laughs> ask us, what are the next improvements in technology going to be, smart guy? And we say, no idea. Right? And we generally don't know where it's going to come from. But we do have to do a better job at envisioning what the future looks like. So I think what I'm supposed to do now is Q&A, both from, um, uh, from cyberspace and from real space. Okay. Um, is this on? Like is this on? Yeah. OK. Um, we've got lots of questions from outside the room. So I'm just going to start with um, one. And it's a pretty uh, straightforward question. So ultimately, carbon pricing policy needs political will, AKA votes. So which approach to carbon pricing will best help ordinary families? Political will, which approach is best for families? Um, I'm allocating these questions. I'm not answering them <laughs> until I really feel the need. Um, so who would like to take a shot at that? Anybody? Which approach to carbon pricing is going to be best most successful to sell politically. If only Arnold Schwarzenegger were in the room. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll jump in and get things. So it seems to me that choosing between tax and cap and trade is actually not that important. Um, they can, the dials can be turned to make either of them operate in a fairly similar manner. I think the key is some of the things the group said. Start with a relatively modest price. 
people in businesses can't make big changes in the drop of a hat. A carbon price comes in tomorrow, you're not going to run out and sell your car or buy a new house. But if you know that it, over five years it's going to ramp up gradually, as you're looking to the future and you're making changes in your own lifestyle or in business investment, you plan that into your long-term investment decision making. So I would say start modestly, economy-wide, but ramp up gradually so that people actually have time to adjust, anticipate, and take opportunity and plan around it. What Can I? The one thing I might add to that too is that, uh, that whichever road you pick, and I must admit I'm agnostic, um, it's important uh, to have a long-term goal of alignment. Um, and I think that was stressed in the report and it's easy to lose sight of that. And so having partners that you're aligned with, that's a good thing. Well, the poli on the, the political side, I mean, the part of the, the, the economics is agnostic about which route. There's pros and cons between carbon taxes and cap and trade. You know what, you can implement either. I'm not a political scientist. I don't know which one is politically more expedient. But what I can tell you is that, that Canadians won't understand what, what the impact is going to be on them. And that's why I emphasized having a vision to try and get people to understand what the future looks like if we accomplish this. Because if they actually understand this is going to create jobs, this is going to create income, this is going to make the economy better off, you know what? It gets a lot easier to politically sell regardless of what the mechanism is that you're actually using. Okay, now we don't all have to answer. I mean, if you want to answer it, okay. please do, yeah. but we don't. Keep moving. Okay. Jesse? No, I think you the audience. Back to the audience. Back to the audience. Okay, Alex has one. Hi. Tom. Uh, hi. Uh, it, it was mentioned that uh, Ontarians are the ones that are going to be investing in this and uh, paying a lot of the costs of this. Uh, and a lot of those will fall to families and businesses. And I was surprised that there was no mention from the panel of how we help families to adapt and integrate into the system. Uh, if, especially if we're talking about a dedicated fund that's investing primarily in infrastructure and green programs, how do we integrate that with families? So I wondered if there was a little bit more uh, thought we had. Excellent there. question. How do we help families to adapt to some form of carbon pricing? Well, that, that's where I said it, it should never go into general revenue. It should go into targeted funds, whether it's for transit renewal, whether it's for social housing, um, and then investing in clean tech uh, industries, will, which will then manifest itself in jobs. So I think that we have to be wary of whichever system we go uh, to that the revenues do not just go into general revenue. Is that a tangible enough connection well, well, to it's, please it's a, the families? It's a bit of a false dichotomy. I mean, families all work. So at their place of work, they can see changes in their, their business and whether it's competitive. And if you go back to energy efficiency products, it can range from lighting and LEDs, which we already see, and mechanisms for people to learn how to reduce their energy costs in their home, reduce their water usage. So there are education programs that can go along with the promotion of the purchase of these products that would help families uh, understand how it impacts them. But I think, um, Craig, you made the point, which is there should be very full reporting on what the progress is and the different mechanisms being used so that anyone can see that their investment is being well allocated and they know what they're getting for their money. As a, a consumer product company, I, I, and I'm interested in people being able to adapt to new technologies, a whole range of them. I'd love if we, we had really good, effective, maybe even free opportunities to charge up our cars at night and uh, when, when we're off peak. But even better, wouldn't it be great if there was a recharge station at work so that you had twice the, the distance? So there's all kinds of things that you can do to support families in that regard. Uh, and if you don't uh, factor that aspect in and include the consumer, you're not getting the whole, uh, the whole thing. What you're doing. The thing I would sure. say is, as a, as a father of um, two young toddlers, one of whom I'm annoyed with right now, um, the best thing I want <laughs> the government to do is to help them prepare for a better future. That's what we need governments for. Uh, there's lots of stuff we can do as a family, but things like climate change or managing an economic transition, I can't do that. Uh, we actually need government to help us make that. And so I want to know that my kids are going to grow up in a world in which Canada is actually well positioned to create jobs and growth in a new economy. 
And I'm going to grow up in a world that doesn't face devastating climate change. Mm -hmm. And so that's how you'd help my family. To, to, to the extent that you also have your, your, you know, you put a price on carbon, and to the extent that that, that, that price does get passed along to consumers, ultimately you then need to think about, you know, this goes back to the policy alignment issue, but also you have to think about your, your policies in a very holistic way. So like to the extent that you are putting additional price pressures on households at the lower end of the income scale, it fits into the mandate to try to address things like income inequality and help people at the low end of the income scale. And again, some of the fiscal recycled money can be targeted to help you know, adjust, you know, respond to the pressures that actually come if you start to see prices getting passed along to, to the consumer. But, but ultimately, you know, again, this is, this is about building an economy of the future. And ultimately, it goes back to jobs, income, prosperity. So you know what? As you go through the, the, the changes, you know, as, you, as you shift the policy mix, you're going to go through transformations. And obviously, the government needs to bear what, be aware of what those transformations are and then address them. And they will have some fiscal capacity to do so. Joanna, you've got another question. Mel Cap, one of our commissioners. Hi. Um, Michael and uh, David both talked about international competition. Um, and Michael, you solved the Chinese problem by giving the, your industry a subsidy. I'd rather hear you talk about border measures. How do we equilibrate uh, the carbon content of imports and uh, allow fair, a level playing field for competition? And it's meant to apply to all of you. And what, what we originally proposed to the government um, was that uh, any, any um, imported cement into Canada, there are only four players who import cement to Canada, two being Canadian uh, companies, that when that cement is sold into the concrete industry, a new carbon tax would be applied to that because we would prefer to have a border adjustment mechanism, but under the World Trade Organization rules, subnational governments and even national governments mm -hmm. cannot uh, favor domestic industries over um, uh, those who import into our country. So we would have preferred that. We asked for uh, a new carbon tax to be established uh, so that we could you know, make the people who are importing you know, pay to pollute, you know, in uh, you know in in Canada, but the government couldn't get their their arms around that. They felt that was a new tax, and somebody t whispered in their ear it would increase the price of concrete and all homes and buildings in British Columbia. Not un government not understanding that the private sector, the market sets the price for commodities, not governments. So we tried to do that. So you know the. You know, after the fifth year of trying, and we said, look, we've exhausted our solutions, you come up with one. And they came up with this transitional fund that will be used uh, by us to develop new technologies um, in the medium, short, medium, and long term to get off coal and use uh, low carbon fuels or carbon neutral fuels. And so it will take a you know, three to five year transition uh, period to do that. I mean, in the auto sector, the most important thing that has happened to, uh, to sustain us uh, in the last couple of years was alignment of fuel economy regulations between Canada and the United States. If we were dealing with different uh, 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 standards on that and safety and whatever, it would have been a nightmare. Um, now, uh, what we don't want to do is to suddenly increase the costs of plants in Ontario versus other jurisdictions where we're competing. My biggest uh, number one priority at General Motors is to make sure we fill up all those auto plants with great new uh, products for the future. Nothing's more important than that. And we're working very hard on that. So we certainly don't want an additional cost laid on top of it. However, you give us the chance to earn our way out of that with uh, more fuel efficiency in our plants, uh, better use, being landfill free, recognizing some of the benefits of that. Um, hey, that's fair game. That's good. We will we'll, uh, be able to, to close that gap. And if we end up with a, a regime here that can perhaps attract some of the best new automotive technology for the future, because that's something that uh, we can do in Ontario better than other places, I'm all game for that too. 
Alex, no. you've got our next question. Sephora. Thank you, Chris. Um, Stuart, you, you spoke about the importance of government ensuring climate safety, and to that end, Canada committed in Copenhagen to two degrees to, in the Copenhagen Accord, to trying to align our policies with two degrees. Yet here we're talking about the role of provinces, which is important and critical, and, um, but we know that neither the provinces individually nor pricing, especially if we start with a moderate price in the near term, will help us meet our climate targets. And Canada can't currently meet our climate targets. So then, what, in your opinion, is the role of the feds, especially given that we're in the run-up to Paris and Canada has traditionally played a fairly important role helping internationally to deal with intransigent issues? So what's the role of the feds and then what is the role of regulation? Couldn't have happened to a nicer guy, Stuart. <laughs> oh, you really were waiting for that, weren't you? Did you plant that It was question? directly to you. <laughs> um, that's a good question. She could have asked me, but she asked you. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> you, you can follow up. So um, I guess I would say a few things. Um, obviously, because transitioning to a low-carbon economy takes time, right? I mean, changing our power systems, changing our transportation systems, changing our building infrastructure isn't going to happen overnight. Um, the further out we look, the better the chance we have of actually making significant big gains. We should do everything we can to try to meet our Copenhagen targets. We've waited a long time to take it seriously. It's going to be tough. To me, the biggest issue, though, is your sort of federal provincial question. We debated this a lot in the Ecofiscal Commission, as Chris will tell you. And I guess here's what I would distill out as the lessons of this, and it's something that I've seen as an observer of Canadian environmental law for a couple of decades. It's amazing how much policy leadership in Canada has started with provinces. You think about Medicare, you think about deficit fighting, you think about many areas of environmental law. I could talk about environmental assessment, pollution control, endangered species. The pattern you typically see is two or three provinces move early. They're called policy entrepreneurs. So they, in the US, they actually call it the California effect. They have a name for it. Um, but it's that they get out ahead, right? They, they take a risk and people say, does that work? BC and Quebec, uh, in some extent, are doing that already in Canada. And Ontario is about to join them. But what you then see is a period of consolidation and ramping it up where you actually need a federal government. And there's specific things like border tax measures, vehicle fuel standards that you know, constitutionally the federal government has to do. But I think, yes, the provinces should take the lead. Ultimately, the federal government's going to have to be the one that fills gaps, provides a national floor, and pushes some of the ones that may be a bit more reluctant to go further. And to me, the best example of that is what we saw around free trade. It sort of links into this getting ready for the future. Is that Things like a big economic transition require something that's hard to muster, which is government leadership. And we say that word a lot, but it's hard to lead when you're governments because you want to get reelected. But there have been examples in the past in Canada where we've seen governments that have seen that we're about to go through major shifts in our economy, like getting deficits under control, shifting to free trade. We have a history of getting out ahead of those shifts in Canada through far-sighted action by both left-wing and right-wing governments. I think we're at one of those moments here. It really is. This is a significant global economic shift, and some of the world's most respected economic authorities are saying that, not me. And if we can take that same approach here that we've taken in other issues, we'll need the federal government to play a key role in driving that. I'd like to answer this question, too, if I may. Um, I think it's important to make the distinction between climate policy as a broad umbrella and carbon pricing. Carbon pricing, we, and we make this, this distinction clearly in the report, probably not as clearly as we should, but carbon pricing is not the be-all and the end-all. It is a very good way to achieve emissions reductions from a particular set of emitters, okay? But it is not the only kind of policy that could be used or should be used um, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. There is a role for regulations of some types, and there is a role, and I'll talk, the question was about the federal role. Um, so make a distinction between climate policies and carbon pricing. There are things that the federal government is doing right now that are very good. We've talked about federal vehicle regulations. Uh, I, I think actually given that, that cars move across borders, or typically the good ones do, um, you know, it's actually perfectly sensible to use a regulatory approach for that and to, to have federal regulations. Uh, SDTC is a federal creation, the, the federal government supporting uh, technological development, which, is, which could be expanded, could be made better in ways that only Vicky knows, or at least, at least Vicky knows. Um, but 
but that is a, a very good place for federal, uh, federal role. Uh, we've talked a bit about border measures, where, of course, anything that's between provinces or across international borders, the, the Fed would have to be involved. But the point that we make, a very important point in this report, is that carbon pricing itself is something that is very well done by the provinces. And there are some things that just make it challenging for a federal government to do of any political stripe. Making policies different, uh, differently designed in each of the different provinces, and guaranteeing in a credible way that revenues will be staying in those provinces, that's not impossible to do, but it is challenging to do. So while we are suggesting that carbon pricing can be done, and frankly is being done very well at the provincial level, that doesn't mean there's not a role for the federal government in under the broader um, umbrella. So make that important distinction. Uh, we've got another question from Jesse. Yes, we're going we're gonna to take three more questions. So this and then two more. Um, so this question is, uh, is for the panel in general. Um, businesses are likely to ask for uh, special considerations, including transition funds. But how should governments decide who gets those special transition funds and who doesn't? And how do you explain to the people on the street um, why uh, businesses that are big emitters are getting money back and they still have to pay higher prices. Okay, how to decide um, which business interests to listen to and how to explain those measures of support to the man on the street. Who would like to take a shot at that? It's an easy, easy question. Just a, it's like a, it's like a, a law. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, it's energy intensive trade exposed industries. Okay, for number one, so declare self interest, but we are energy intensive, we are trade exposed, we need some uh, transitionary measures. The, when we build a cement plant, it's there for you know, 75 or 100 years. You know, there's a lot of capital invested, it takes time to switch the capital. So I, I realistically think that you can make a, a case for some transitional uh, resources, uh, free allocations. Uh, so focus on emissions cetera. intensive trade exposed sectors as the ones that are the credible cases. Anybody want to add anything to that quickly? We're going to have to ask for shorter answers to international benchmarking so that we understand what that competitive disadvantage really looks like. Uh, I think there's some focus then on whether there is a real disadvantage or a perceived one. And how do we explain this to the man on the street? Difficult. Well, I think everybody well, should be accountable for being able to, to take those proceeds and do something with them that I mean, is getting us a benefit. So you can, it's not easy, right? Anytime you're basically providing subsidies to businesses, it's, it, you're going to have to explain why, why you're doing it. And quite frankly, that's part of accountability and that's perfectly reasonable. However, you can do good case studies to help drive home a point, right? So if you want an illustration of this, when, when free trade was going to come into Canada, uh, there was absolute consensus the, the wine industry in Canada was going to get completely wiped out because the wine industry in Canada was producing absolute crap. And as a consequence, it was not a competitive industry. So one of the things that happened in advance of free trade was the industry in Canada actually was provided some transitional support so that they could change the products that they were actually making. And the end result of that now is a world-class industry that is highly competitive, very profitable, and has a lot of knock-on effects to the domestic economy through things like agritourism. So at the end of the day, you can come up with good examples of where you provide transitional support to businesses, and the end outcome is far better than if you didn't actually provide that transition. I do take the point, though, it is hard to choose which industries you're going to say yes to and which industries you're going to say no to. Craig's so, mention of the wine industry, just for those people who would like to read about it, if you pick up the country's leading textbook in the Principles of Economics <laughs> and you check out <laughs> Chapter 33 on trade policy, there's a very nice discussion of free trade as a uh, wine as the free trade success story. So yes. no two quick things. Sell it on the man on the street is it, it's got a, it's got an exit strategy. That support really is transitional, and it's linked to investing in cleaner technology that will prepare these companies to compete in a low carbon future. I'd have a sunset period, and I'd have outcomes linked to that. Yeah. Second exactly. thing that I guess I would say, um, well, you know, that's enough. With the time limit, let's just go with that. Okay, Joanna. 
Thanks. First of all, I, I agree with the panel that any money that is collected in any form has to go to the issue at hand and not into general government coffers because nobody will take any government seriously who uses this as a way to shore up their fiscal irresponsibilities. Having said that, um, I want to agree with um, Vicki in the sense that I think we have to look at this as an opportunity situation. Uh, in Canada, we have small business is the backbone of the country. They typically are the invisible majority that people ignore when they write policies. So I implore the, um, the group of 12, uh, when you are looking at this, I note that in your report you mentioned the word small business once. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> but they represent 7.7 uh, .7 million employees across the country in small business that are con companies with less than 100 people. They aren't experts in carbon pricing. The kind of help they will need will also be, first of all, education on what you're talking about because um, they, they aren't stupid. They're just very busy people trying to make a, make a job or get something out the door. So when you're doing all this, um, they're 98% of the economy and they represent over 55% of GDP. So pay attention to them, please. Any have responses on that? I think well, it wasn't agree. a question. You noticed that. It's, it was good. A, it's good. We, it's yeah. good. Yeah. Yes. Good. <laughs> no disagreement. Uh, do Chris. we have another question? Yes. Uh, okay. Alex, up here. And Joanna, you've got one first. And then we must be hitting up against a. Just want to pick up on, on the comment about making uh, this, uh, you know, developing a vision and making the messaging simple. I think it's really challenging. We're talking about carbon, we're talking about climate, which is really hard for people to see. I guess I, I, and I just, and we are going to, and, and the good thing is we are beginning to have a discussion on this. And I guess I just encourage people in, in terms of the way that, that I think the, the issue needs to be positioned um, from a strategic level is to re remind Canadians that 81% of our man made greenhouse gas emissions come from the production and use of energy. So that's an important relationship people don't understand. When you're talking climate change, it's almost all carbon. There's a little bit of non carbon, no, not, not all, all energy little bit of non-energy, but 81% energy. And work from the University of Alberta has indicated that we're currently wasting more than 50% of our energy. So the potential is very large. And I, and I think it's very scary for people to think you're gonna put a cost on this and I don't know how I'm gonna do it. And I think if they got the sense that I can focus on this 81%, this energy, and we're wasting half of that stuff. And, and if people begin to think about that, then I think then that's getting towards a vision and it's putting it in terms that people can understand. That was a good statement. <laughs> Massive agreement here on the, uh, on the panel. Okay, sir. Yes. Uh, I've heard uh, a lot of talk about the price being put on now onto carbon or carbon tax. Uh, but not one person has mentioned the mother of all carbon taxes, and that was the one imposed by the OPEC countries uh, in the 1973, which has increased the price of oil from $2 a barrel to whatever it is now. And that has introduced massive amounts of uh, improvements in technology into our society. And we've a lot to learn from that. And I'm quite a little surprised that nobody made any mention. It sounds like putting a price on carbon is a new idea. It's been around for a long time and we've learned a lot. And I'll just touch briefly on the cars. My first car was a 49 Pontiac, a lovely V8, or a straight eight, I think. I got uh, 10 miles per gallon, but it cost me 20 cents to buy a gallon of gas. Well, you wouldn't sell a car that was that inefficient now. So, but we've learned a tremendous amount and I'm a little puzzled that it's never been mentioned. In the interest of time, because that's going to be our last question, I'm going to provide a very quick response and if anybody really wants to jump in, please feel free. But one of the key points that we make in, in both of our reports is that exactly as you say, the high price of oil that was contributed to by OPEC's actions in 1973 and 79 drove enormous innovation, not just in the auto sector, but elsewhere. Uh, and a key point of carbon pricing is not just to attach a price to pollution and create incentives to pollute less, that's certainly part of it, but it's also to drive innovation. And that innovation, part of that innovation is to innovate your way away from pollution. So while that might not have been said explicitly, it, it lay behind most of what was being said here, is that it is a key part 
Uh, and it's one of the things, frankly, that isn't well uh, captured in the model, modeling exercise that we did in our report, because basically innovation isn't something well captured in economic models. Um, but it is, it, is, it is one of the benefits, one of the tremendous benefits that is expected to come from carbon pricing over time. As long as you've got a carbon price in place, especially if it's rising slowly over time, that ongoing price signal provides an ongoing incentive to drive innovation. Regulation doesn't do that. There's an incentive to meet the regulation and you, then you're done. But when you've got a carbon price in place, then you've constantly got a, a market-based profit incentive to do better. And the way that we do better is by innovating. So this is a key part of, of what we're talking about. I promise you, if you get the report tonight, take it home, do a search on the word for innovate and innovation, it will be all over the place. Unfortunately, small business is not there with the same, um, that wasn't planned, by the way. Only, <laughs> only one time, apparently. Innovation is there at least twice. <laughs> uh, we've got to stop. Um, I want to thank everybody on the panel. Thank you, Stuart, for moderating. Thank you, the four of you, for a great discussion. Thank all of you for your questions. Um, I just want to, I want to thank again the Cement Industry and Sustainable Prosperity for partnering for this event um, and, uh, and for bringing you the uh, nutritious uh, and low-carbon snacks that have just been wheeled in. Uh, so please stay. We're going to move the chairs quickly. Stay, grab something to eat and drink, and uh, keep calm and have a drink and chat about carbon pricing. Thank you. <laughs>